Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. Firstly, I want to thank all of you for a very successful August 2018 enrollment period. We filled all of our spots in about four days, and I couldn't believe it. So thank you so much for that. If you want to join our our program, go to OnlineGreatBooks.com, go to the right top right corner and click join now and then join the VIP waiting list because we're going to open enrollment again on October 15th. And I think the waiting list is going to be longer and we're going to fill up not in four days. I bet we fill up in three. So if you want in, you better go join that VIP waiting list and we'll put you to the front of the line. This show is with a man who goes by his pen name is Quintus Curtius. He's who I think more people need to be. He's an autodidact. He, he is self-taught. Uh, he's a disciplined guy. He thinks and reads and translates uh, classic Latin books in his spare time. That's his hobby, or at least one of them. He went to MIT. He was in the Marine Corps, and now he's an attorney. And he just works really hard um, at you know the hard things. And he has, he has an interesting life. He has interesting things to say. So you can go to qcurtius.com and check out his website. Um, you can buy his books there. His, uh, he's got Salus, The Conspiracy of the Catiline, and The War of uh, Jugurtha. Um, he's translated Cicero's On Duties. He's got a book on Stoic Paradoxes and others. And you can also follow him on Twitter. He's Quintus Curtius there. He's a great guy. I'm just going to go right into the interview. I hope you guys enjoy it because this guy is living out the sort of democratic ideal, you know, where every man can work with these books and benefit from it. Hope you enjoy it. So you're Quintus Curtius. I found you on Twitter some time ago, but, and I was like, man, this guy's like a crazy autodidact, uh, <laughs> writing, writing about travel, writing about these books, translating books on his own, and, and not an academic, right? Like most of the time, people uh, that are doing trans, translations of these ancient texts are some sort of a you know, university staffer somewhere. And I was like, man, this guy's doing what I want everybody to do. Yeah. Um, so I so I got, so I had to seek you out. So first, I want to ask you, uh, why Quintus Curtius? Oh man, you know I I, I wish uh, I wish that I could tell you, Scott, that that there's a great story behind that. <laughs> I really wish I could tell you there's some special significance behind that, but you know, honestly, it just kind of came at a uh, at a spur of the moment. I was. Uh, when I first really started writing seriously, uh, you know, putting out articles in 2012, I just looked over on my bookshelf, and, and for some reason, one of the f- one of the first names that just entered my field of vision was Quintus Curtius's uh, History of Alexander the Great, and I just I just thought it sounded um, I thought it sounded appealing, and I just decided to to use that as a pen name. At least temporarily, anyway. And so, uh, but you know, as as time goes on, you kind of get wedded to these identities. So <laughs> you just continue it, really. But that's the story. So, so you're an attorney, and you've got yes. uh, Quintus Curtius's uh, uh, Life of Alexander on the bookshelf behind you, and you, and uh, in your spare time for sport, I guess you're translating you know, Cicero and and oh, Sallust. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, it's it's really you know it's it's just an interest I've always had. I, I've um, I originally had a military background. I I graduated uh, from MIT in 1990, and I was uh, in the Marine Corps for uh, almost five years. And then I got out and went to law school uh, in the Midwest here. And um, you know I've been practicing law since really 1999, but I've always been interested in in philosophical and literary and linguistic subjects and for me it's um it's just a very strong interest i have i i I, for for many reasons i I find it very comforting i find it very inspiring and i find it very soothing really to be in the company of these um 
of these great men and these great works. So luckily I've been able to, to really turn that into um, an interest that other people have found useful. Yeah. So that's, that's interesting that you said comforting. I, I, I actually find the same thing in, in reading, you know, I'm like, Oh, it's uncle Socrates, you know? Yeah. 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 It's like, these are old friends. Yeah. It is comforting. I hadn't really, I hadn't really put the word to, to that, uh, that, that feeling, but, uh, that's true. So what, what is that, what is that comfort like for you? Like, is it like a refuge from yeah. modernity uh, or what is it? I think, you know, well, I think Cicero talks about this a little bit in, um, on moral ends in book five in, um, on moral ends, um, definibus bonorum et malorum is the actual title. But he, he says, I think within every man, there's an instinctive l- love for, what we feel is the truth, or we're instinctively drawn to things that uh, bespeak virtue and character and the nobility of the soul. And I think that's something that that really is inherent in all of us. Some of us choose to run with it and develop it and indulge it, and some of us choose maybe to put it on the back burner. But I think I think it these great works represent for us everything that that is lacking i think in in modern society whereas modern society emphasizes the transitory ephemeral nature of of um of voluptuary goods and and uh, physical pleasures i think the the great works of of um of philosophy and history and and um and ethics really remind us of what we should be aspiring to. And it really points the way towards a greatness of soul, a, a real elevating spirit that, that gives, gives us wings and enables us to soar above the, the, the mundane, the crushing burdens of, of everyday life. Uh, I know I may be putting it in prosaic terms, but I, I really believe that. And I hope others believe that as well. Yeah, I think reading those these books, um, maybe I should say what these books are. For for me, these books are really the Western canon, right? It's stuff that's go, that uh, is part of what Mortimer Adler called the Great Conversation that starts with maybe yeah some, somewhere around Homer and then ends up you know with with some of these more modern writers. But they're all self referential, right? So you're talking about Cicero and he talks about Socrates and he talks about Aristotle, and uh, in in the in the and uh, he quotes the Iliad, right? So he's in conversation with these people. That that's what these books are for me, and uh, and I, I think I agree with you. They they put me in touch with something bigger than me, like these ideals that you're talking about these virtues that put me in, in touch with something bigger than me. And then that, that is, that is in turn comforting to me. Oh yeah. 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 You know, and, and, and it has practical benefits too, Scott. I think one of the things that people often overlook is that, you know, focusing on uh, the classical texts or the foundational texts of, of Western civilization has practical benefits. It, it puts you in direct contact with that continuity of thought that stretches all the way back, as you said, to, to Homer. I mean, if, if, if the average person has a, has a pretty good grounding in the Iliad and the Odyssey and some of the other basic classical texts, and also has maybe read, or at least has a familiarity with the stories in the Bible. And again, I'm not going to, I'm not into any sort of specific sectarian affiliate. I'm just saying in general, <laughs> you you're you're able to understand a lot of works of art if you go into a museum and you see a painting of say uh, i mean how how many paintings are take their take their themes from say biblical stories or from classical mythology or from classical history i mean 80% 80 90% of them and if you can get that you can understand what you're seeing and i think i've i've overheard i overhear a lot of times people in museums or they're trying to read modern books and there's references in there to stories either from the classical world or the medieval world. And they, they don't get it because they haven't been shown any of this, any of these things. It's, it's just very, it's very sad really. Yeah. I, 
that's what that's that's one of the reasons we read them uh, yeah, there, i mean there's it, it's it, because the cultural context that it provides so we already talked about this comfort and this uh, uh, informing us and letting us know what these these higher virtues and these higher ideals are but there's also the just the cultural context it provides you you know i tell people all the time that everybody knows the story of the trojan horse but not everybody knows that that was the Trojan War, and that that's about what the Iliad's about. And they're always upset at the way, at the end of the Iliad, by the way, when they don't get the Trojan horse story in the Iliad. Right. Uh, Good point. They forget that the Iliad only covers a small period of time at the very end of the war, and it ends with, uh, you know, the um, uh, the death of Hector, I, I guess, right? The, when the ho- Breaker of horses. He's that's uh, right. That's yeah. right. And, uh, and Helen... Helen's the face that launched a thousand ships. People have heard that. And, uh, it's you know, not in there either, right? It's not in there either. It, is that, who is, that's a, gosh, it's like Pope or something. It's a, it's one of the English poets, but he's referring to Helen of the Iliad. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I listened, uh, Scott, for the, I, I think just last summer, I listened to an audio version of the, the Iliad, which I had never done before. And, uh, you know, I was really reminded, it, it was amazing to me, uh, if people actually knew what was in these old books, they would be very surprised at how edgy, I mean, it's extremely violent. Yeah. You know, it's, it, there's, there, there's graphic descriptions in there of, of spears crashing through faces, smashing through pallets, and, and, mm-hmm. and in the most graphic, gory detail. And I, and I think people sometimes think that, they think that a lot of, you know, Homer might be like this, this boring, um, you know, John Milton, Paradise Lost, you know, where he just goes on and on and on about people thinking about things. But they, it's a very action oriented. <laughs> yes, it uh, it's and it had to be it was it was meant to to entertain people uh, in, in, you know, group settings. But it's it's very, very graphic. And so for that reason alone, people should, should, should try and see what they think. <laughs> yeah, I just looked it up. It's Marlowe that said that Helen was the face that launched a thousand ships. Christopher Marlowe. Yeah. Yeah, man, it's violent. It's violent. But so you were a grunt, right? You were a Marine. Yeah. And you yeah. were interested in these, in these books. And where, where did that interest come from? Well, I, I, ever since childhood, Scott, I, I had been, um, I don't know what it is. I, I think the the interests originally came sort of a, a, a linguistic impulse. I, I was always interested in languages and, and stories and history. And, you know, I, I had been exposed to Polybius and, and Thucydides and, mm-hmm. and um, you know, some of the uh, Livy and some of the other great historians when I was a, a kid. I just, I just, I don't know. I was just drawn to these things. You know, some, some guys like to work on cars and build their own cars. I mean, I, I like to, I like to read the historians and I like to, I like to look at maps and I like to hear about uh, adventures and travel and, and geography. And I, these were just things that I liked and it was something that I always kept. And, um, but I never really wrote about it, but it, you know, there was a, a period in my life when I, I guess I was just ready to do it. Somehow, I think I, I went. I was going through some, some, uh, I guess, some personal struggles that uh, presented writing as a way for me to, uh, I guess, express myself in ways I had not done before. And and I, I, I found that it it was just very, very uh, satisfying. And I f- realized that I, I had this talent and that I had this capability, and I, I wanted to uh, to continue to do that. So, so you had this interest in these old books, you said Polybius and, and so on, and you're in the Marine Corps. Are you reading Latin at that time? Uh, well, I, I had uh, uh, not as good as I am now. I mean, I, I, had to under, I had to undergo a number of years of intense self-study to get to the point where I can translate it at the level that I'm, that I'm doing right now. I had studied it in high school, but you know how that goes. It's, uh, it's a very rudimentary exposure. Um, but it was really starting in the early 2000s that I really applied myself with, with real diligence for, you know, I'd say a good period of like four years of really intense study and memorization. And 
that's one thing that I think people don't often appreciate is, it, it, and I've written about this in uh, in my books, 37 and Pantheon. If you really want to learn a language, you, it has to be a lifelong uh, enterprise. You're, you'll be able to get good after a few years of devoted self-study, but, but um, you, you have to, you have to do it all the time. It has to be part of, unless you're the type of neurotic uh, uh, <laughs> person that's going to be carrying around word, word lists with you, which I am. Uh, you're you're not going to you're not going to get, and that, that, that's it. Doesn't matter what language, whether it's a modern or a, or an ancient language, it, the principles are exactly the same. So, what when you were in the throes of learning this, you said it was like a four year period. What were what was your what was your study regimen or schedule like? Every day. Oh, you you know, um, it, it, at least an hour and a half every day. An hour and a half every day to get to the point where you're actually translating Latin texts and publishing right. things. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, it's it's a number of years of devoted, intense uh, study of uh, the books, the textbooks, the grammar books, uh, selections from selections from Latin authors, starting from the simpler ones, working one's way up to some of the more uh, difficult ones. But again, if, if, if the interest is there and the motivation is there, and if it's something that the person enjoys, uh, it, it will come as a, uh, it will come as a natural, uh, as a natural thing. So I, I, I get, we're doing this on uh, on Zoom, so I can see. You know, we got video here, and I can see behind you. Do, is that a bunch of lobes? That's right. You? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So is that right. your main? So lobe classic editions are what they're published by Oxford, I guess, and they're a side by side for you guys that don't know. It's a. I think the left side is going to be well for the red ones. The left side is Latin. The left page is Latin, and the right side is English, I believe. Right. So right. You, you I have a check number, your work. Yeah, I, I have a number of uh, th those are published by Harvard University Press. Harvard. Um, yeah. And uh, there's also, but that isn't my only bookshelf. I've got I've got others, so you can't see them, but the, right. they're on the d are different sides of me here. But that's just one small uh, shelf. But also there is. Uh, I also have uh, have have bought a lot of books from the. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Tati Renaissance uh, Tati Renaissance Library. Uh, this Harvard University Press also has. Uh, they publish uh, works of Renaissance writers in in Latin, and, and again, it's it's the facing. You have the original text, and then an English translation. Uh, the lobes on the whole are, are very good. It's the only series out there that really has every. Um, Every writer. Uh, the, the problem. A lot of the a lot of the translations are extremely old and dated. That's that's I think one mm. of the big problems is m many of them. Uh, I would say maybe even most of them are over a hundred years old. And um, it's better than nothing. If, if if someone has no other alternative, it's certainly better than nothing. Um, and it's frankly, it's the only practical way to get the um, you know, uh, uh, a purchasable version of a, of a bound text, but they're not, they're not without flaws. I mean, I also think that the size of the books also leaves something to be desired. I think they're very small. Yeah. They're hard to write in. Or they're hard to read. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, again, we, we have to, we have to use what we have, but I think the, the age is crying out for a new generation of people to undertake. And that really was really what the motivation for me was to, to take on, on duties and, and Salist and now, uh, you know, on moral ends. Yeah. So it was the need because the, the, what's, what, what is out there now is simply in my view, not adequate to meet the needs of the modern student or, yeah. or serious uh, enthusiast. So let's kind of bring that story up to date. So you went to the Marine Corps. Well, you, well, you took a little Latin in high school, always interested in these books and maps and history and philosophy and so on. You know, the Marine Corps, you get out, you go to law school, you get out of law school. And then uh, because you're just never sassified, <laughs> you start this, uh, this study of Latin. Uh, and now, now here we are, it's a 2018 and you've pub, you've translated and published, um, 
some works by Cicero, Sallust. Right. So, and so you've taken this, this, what was a hobby and, uh, well, I mean, I guess it's still a hobby, but, uh, but, uh, it's gotten very, very serious, hasn't it? Right. Right. I, I, you know, it's just, I think it's just a natural evolution of, of, uh, of an interest. <laughs> you, know, you know, at, at onlinegreatbooks.com, we have a, you know, a community where people are talking about the books they're reading all the time. It's, you know, there's chat going on in there like 24 hours a day. It's almost too much for me sometimes, but there is a group of those people. Uh, this is just organically popped up and I had no, and I had no hand in this, but there are a group of people in there that have started a, a chat channel in our community and they are teaching each other uh, ancient Greek. Oh, fantastic. One of our, uh, one of our seminar hosts, the guy that works with me for me, whatever his name's John Pascarella. And he's a, uh, uh, he's an ancient Greek scholar guy who reads all this stuff. His specialty is Aristotle. And so he's in there helping those guys uh, wow. and, and ladies work on this ancient Greek. And we just kicked off on great books in January, 2018. So we're only in it for, about seven months right now. And we're only reading Greek texts thus far. Next year we'll be moving into Latins and I'm, I'm certain that we'll be starting to learn Latin channel and we'll have people in there, you know, working hard on, on Latin. And I kind of, I actually, th- I actually think that we may, uh, we may offer an opportunity to read uh, Caesar's war in Gaul in Latin as part of our, very our, nice uh, very nice fantastic yeah that's great that's great scott i, th- I think uh, i think the more the more you can expose people to you know that that's just so important to, because i think so many people out there they develop these um this again this is my own personal feeling but i think one of the obstacles that people defeat themselves with uh not just the classical languages with greek and latin but with any any languages they develop all these psychological barriers they think it's inherently difficult they think it's impossible what they fail to recognize is that look human beings spoke these languages i mean just in the same way that you and i are speaking english right now human beings spoke these languages and um if if you can just hear it spoken, I think if if someone can and they can hear, you know, real conversations and dialogues in these languages, I think a lot of these psychological barriers are are, are taken down, and um, it's 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 humanized for for people, you know. But I think and, and maybe I think I think the lack of good instruction I think is partly to blame. Right. I think a, a, too many, and I've I've been a, been a big critic of this. Too many scholars, uh, too many of these professional scholars, have artificially erected these uh, elaborate spider webs of boundaries, <laughs> uh, partly right. partly to make themselves feel good, partly to maybe intimidate the 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 amateur or the or the um, you know the the the, the novice, uh, and I I don't agree with that. I think there there was a time in European history and even American history when 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 Latin uh, at least Latin, maybe sometimes even Greek too, were, were, were part of everyone's curriculum. It was mm-hmm. just expected that you would, uh, uh, you, it was expected that you would know at least something. I mean, obviously degrees, there were always degrees of, of, of knowledge, but, um, and I think that's, that's one of the real tragedies. I think the fact that the, uh, you know, people would at least have a chance to hear it spoken if they went to a Catholic mass, a traditional mass, they could at least hear the language spoken. So even if they may not have understood every word, the psychological barrier of hearing it as a practical language was, was broken. And, and, and But that's gone now. So there's, people develop all these preconceptions and complex, and that's why I would encourage your folks to uh, and I've tweeted about this. There's a there's a a podcast that broadcasts in Latin in 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 mm-hmm. Finland. It's um, Nunti Latini, and it starts out every week. Nunti Latini Radiofonica Finica Generalis Cosvobis Recitat, and then the guy go and he 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 announces because he does like a five minute news summary in Latin which is very nice because it gives you a practical application of, of this. It, it lets you know that this is, this was a language like any other. 
So I'd recommend that if you uh, if you have a chance. <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, one of the things I kind of hate about what we do <laughs> about at onlinegreatbooks.com anyway is that we have to read these things in translation because we don't have the time to learn Greek and Latin and French and whatever, right? So, so these books of the canon are written on all these different languages. And I think it's probably important that we get around to Latin in particular um, for all the reasons you're talking about, but most, a lot of us aren't, right? So tell, tell me, tell me, like you've read a lot of Cicero and you've read it in English, I'm sure. Like you've read other people's translations and you found them to be lacking and you've read it in the Latin. Tell us folks who are only know one language what the differences are in reading a translation of like Cicero, for example, and then actually reading in the original Latin. Oh, wow. What, what can you say about that that would make sense to us people that haven't done that? Well, what I would say, Scott, is it's, it's the, and what I'm going to say holds true for not just Latin, but any, any language, whether it's say Portuguese or French or Arabic or whatever. Um, Wait a minute. Do you when, speak Portuguese? It, 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 I have about a, yeah, I've been going to Brazil for, for many years and I've got a pretty good, Damn it. Proficiency, a pretty good proficiency <laughs> in, in, in Portuguese, but I'm not, I'm not going to claim, because the minute you claim something, then someone's, you know, then, then you're going to, you know, someone's going to say, well, you don't know that. Uh, right. I, I, I would say um, I, I go down there and I've, I've had girlfriends there and I, I and friends and I, I take care of all my business. I, I would, I would call myself a, a uh, it, at least an intermediate level Portuguese speaker. But a- anyway, to, to get back to your question about the differences between hearing a writer in his original speech and in uh, translation, um, it's it's like um, it's like hearing someone. It, it would be like hearing me, uh, like I'm hearing you voice to voice now. And say someone were hearing you through translation, let's say they were hearing you through maybe a, a screen or a, a fog that some that distorts a little bit of what you're saying. Um, a person is always going to be a, a writer, and it, with po- this is a, this is very much true with prose, but poetry is even worse. Poetry is mm. is, is very difficult to, to translate. Um, in any language, uh, they, that's it's notoriously. Uh, and then, 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 then there are the debates that that translators always like to talk about, which is: should you aim for a more literal translation, or should you aim for a more um, flowing or, or interpretive translation? And then there's arguments that you can be made for that. But the best way to say it is: um, the the original language, you're going to get an, an appreciation of the the subject that's going to be deeper and more nuanced than you would if you get through a translation for example you'll be able to appreciate all those little puns and jokes and alliterations and uh, metaphors and all of those sort of linguistic nuances that you may not get uh through uh a translation it's like it'd be like eating chinese food in say an American restaurant and then eating Chinese food in China. You're, you're, you know what I mean? It's maybe that's a, to make a very crude analogy, that might be the way to do it, but let's face it. We can't do everything. Uh, we can't learn every language. No person can realistically hope to undertake more than a, a couple of them. And uh, you have to, uh, you have to make, uh, concessions and, and frankly, a good translation, frankly, can be just as inspiring, I think, and just as um, just as motivating as as an original text. I mean, some of some of my uh, best memories were from from great translations I read of, of you know Thucydides uh, and and maybe other other writers. So. For example, I only I don't speak French. I can't read French. I only know Pascal um, through translation. And the one I have is, or at least I I think it's it, it means a lot to me. It's it's it's, it's wonderful. It, it it's very. Um, I have no way of judging how how reliable it is, but to me, 
it seems it seems great. Right. It seems great. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, we can't we can't do everything, and so you know, we try to. We, well, we talk yeah. about we don't want to read a book about a book, right? Like, if there's no sense in reading a book about Plato if you haven't read Plato. Right. So we talk about that all the time in our program about we want to go to the primary source. And unfortunately, those translations, they really aren't the book. Translations really are kind of a book about the book. So we end up uh, compromising and reading the translations, unfortunately. But, um, but right. you know, I've only read Plato in translation. And yeah, me too. I, I, I can't. There's nothing I don't like know it, Greek. though. I, I don't know Greek. Uh, and... Um, you know, I, I, uh, I don't think I will. I would not go so far as to say that a translation is 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 about the book. I, I, yeah. I will. Uh, what I will agree with you. It's 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 a it's a um, it's one it's one interpreter's view uh, uh, version of the book, and I think that uh, readers can can judge for themselves. Um, I mean, my, my own philosophy of translation is I don't think that translators should take too many liberties with a text. I don't think it's, it's my job to put my own view. Um, I think a translator's default position should be a literal rendition of the original text that preserves the author's original um, what I see is his original meaning and his interpretation, warts and all. I, I like to use the phrase warts and all. It's not my job to get in there and to airbrush him. Uh, just like mm. a painter, or if I'm restoring a painting, let's say, it's not. It, 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 it would be unethical for me as a paint, uh, as a conservationist, let's say. That's a good analogy. Maybe I'm a conservationist. Hmm, I like that. Uh, I'm a conservationist of of rare birds and rare animals. I'm preserving them. No, that's a very good. I oh, sorry, use that. I'm a conservationist. <laughs> so it would be inappropriate for me to restore a, a work of art and 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 take too many liberties with the painter's original. I should just try to bring him to life, and I should just try to remove the fog so that you can see what lies underneath. I think that's a, that's a very I think that's a, a maybe the best of, because I think some uh, some of these translators and I've I've noticed this from reading some versions I think in in my mind they take too many liberties with a text of, of say Cicero they shorten his uh, sentences unforgivably they uh, they I think do violence to his stylistic uh, nuances by by trying to turn him into a I don't know, sort of a modern writer. No, I think I think you can update language. I think language needs to be fresh and clean and clear and 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 lucid. But I don't think it's appropriate to take too many liberties with his stylistic nuances. And I was I I took that view with Sallust, and I I take that view with Cicero as well. So if a person can only read one. Well, we're going to get to the books that you've translated here, but if a person can only read one Cicero uh, volume, what would you have him read? I think On Duties is probably his most famous and uh, the the most. Uh, it, it, it was really made for a lay audience for um, for I would say a mass market audience in in many ways. It's a it's written in a very engaging, stripped down style. And it really contains a very good summary of his um, of his core ethical beliefs. And I think the the reader who has further interests can then branch off into different uh, related related books. Right. Uh, we have people reading uh, his Republic and Laws in in our program because you know. It's a good. It's a good way to find out about the, how the Roman Republic worked and 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 what their go government was like. It wasn't, right. wasn't really about like Cicero's uh, Cicero's thinking or you know his original his original work. It's really just a report ultimately on on their government, and, and it's an answer. Again, we like the, I like the idea, and we like in the great books world, we like the idea of this great conversation, and uh, you know he wrote. 
I was going to say fan fiction. It's not fiction. He wrote a response, a direct response to Plato's Republic and Plato's yeah. Laws. And uh, that's what, so that's what we're having them read. But on duties might be a good addition, huh? Yeah. Well, you know, um, uh, my translation of uh, Stoic Paradox is also contains um, the Somnium Scipionis, the, the Dream of Scipio, which is a part of uh, De, De Republica, the, of the Republic. It's it's one of the uh, one of the essays. It, it it's a it's a it's part of that book. So I I do have some exposure to De Republica. It's a it's an incomplete work, and I, I think it's it's uh, it, it's uh, I think look anything by Cicero is is worth reading. I th- I think even his letters are very engaging and and uh, and and very good. But um, yeah, you know I I think Plato was a was a strong influence on him and his philosophy, um, and you just can't go wrong. I mean Plato, my God, I mean you know how you talk about influence. Uh, it basically has influenced everybody in one way or another. Um, yeah, yeah. So white, white, whitehead says everything's but a footnote to plato you know a lot, there's a lot of truth to that it, yeah so i you know i wanted to talk to you here because i wanted people to hear about i don't i don't want this to sound uh, like a slight but you know i want to hear about some regular dude some amateur <laughs> that's sure. not derogatory that 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 is doing this work uh, to good effect, right? I mean, I think that because you have translated on duties and the Salist work, more people have read it now, and more people are familiar with it. And uh, and yeah. I just I love democratizing all of this stuff, the all of this, all of these books, all of these ideas. They're for us. And right. uh, and uh, I wanted to have you in here because you're inspiring because you have. You have treated it that way. You have treated it like they are for us. And I, I and thank I, I you, man. You. Well, no, I, I thank you for saying that, uh, Scott. And I, I'm very, I would be very gratified if, if I could perform some small service of, of introducing these, these great works to a new generation of young people. And uh, part of, part of the reason that I undertook this work, and this is, in many ways become almost my, my, I feel like it's now becoming my life's mission uh, is, is because frankly, this a real sense of anger and outrage that and <laughs> I'm, I, I'm I, mad all the time, man. I, I have to really be, and maybe I, maybe that's, maybe that's too strong a word, but uh, I, I really resent the fact that the educational system has, has frankly purged a lot of this essential knowledge from the humanities and I was telling someone just the other day, what, what did, you know, the, the original, the original phrase, liberal arts came, uh, liberal came from the, the Latin word liber, which means like the, a free, a free man, the, the knowledge necessary for a free man or a nobleman or a gentleman. These were things that everyone should, should know. And this is what, yeah. uh, the, and I, I feel like the curriculums in many schools have become now uh, so what I would say dumbed down or so uh, removed of, of meaningful content that we are not training our young people in character and we are not training our young people in the importance of, of, of morals and character. And this is really the value of the classical studies in many ways, because there was always a moral lesson behind things. Not, not always, not always, but the writers in those days emphasized different things than writers do now. And they were, many of them were interested in, in, in elevating us and trying to make us better, better people. And I think that we wouldn't have many of the social problems that we have now if, if we could just get this, uh, get this, uh, I, I think, it's it's going to flow automatically the, from if you just read the books, you're automatically going to imbibe all of this message about the importance of, of character and strength and forbearance and and being and knowing thyself and being a good person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, all all of these guys, I say all these guys, this generalization, darn near all these books are about character. 
they really device. are, aren't they? Aren't they? They really are. We just helped a group of people go through Plato's in the the Mino, and so in the Mino, they kick out, they kick the story off or the dialogue off by saying, "You know, can virtue be taught?" And then, yeah. and then Socrates goes, "Ah, King X, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What the hell's virtue?" <laughs> And then right. most of the story, most of the dialogue is drilling down on what that is. And uh, you find out pretty quickly that we don't even really know what some of these things are. We really don't know what justice is. We really don't know what virtue is. And when you start to drill down on your own beliefs about these ideas and you find out that you don't even really know, right? You carry an abstraction yeah. around in your head about what justice is and you, you're hollering for blood and you want justice. But the truth of it is nobody knows what it is. Nobody yeah. really knows. Um, uh, that's actually a pretty wonderful thing to find out. And, uh, and Socrates is, yeah. I mean, he's the best at that. <laughs> he's the best at oh, telling yeah. you, you don't know anything. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, it's, you're right. Uh, I mean, I, yeah, I, I guess, uh, yeah, Plato's dialogues in many ways are, are very, uh, are, are I, I would probably guess most people have maybe the same experience that I did. When you, when you actually look and see what's in these dialogues, it, it's maybe not, not what people think. It's, uh, in many ways, they're very mystical, you know, yeah. they're, they're, there's a real element of uh, otherworldliness to them. Which um, I don't know is very inspiring. I don't. Know, it's it's hard to. It's it's almost like he's introducing a new religion in many ways. Then, Do you know uh, well, what I mean? It's, it's well, yeah, very, we ended up with these Neoplatonists that picked it up right? and kind of turned it into right. a spiritual system. Yeah, I, I kind of think that the some of those some of those Plato dialogues are kind of like a Zen koan. You know, what's the sound of one hand clapping? Like they ask these questions that you just can't answer. Right, <laughs> and, and, the, and, the th and the point of the question is really to show you you don't know anything. You know, Socrates. That's a, that's what he said all the time. The only thing I know is I really don't know anything, and uh, that's that's really good. I think especially for young people. Like, how many times did your dad tell you that you thought you knew everything? <laughs> you know, and I think it's really important for young people to have Socrates kick their ass a little bit and kind of show where where they don't know what they think they know. Right, because that's that's the beginning of like rebuilding a value system, or or not maybe not even rebuilding, but building one. Period is kind of is to know where your deficiencies are and what you, uh, you know, what you're not real solid with. You know, and it, and, and these old books are the best for that. Man, we've talked about this a lot. Uh, I don't know if we need to go on any further, but plug these books, man. Tell us about these. The uh, tell us about your books and where they can get them. And why they ought to read these things. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, well, all of uh, uh, all of my books are available uh, on um, on Amazon. Uh, you can also find links for them on, on my website, uh, qcurtius.com. That's uh, q c u r t i u s dot com, and it takes you to Amazon. I've I've got them available in um, in you know hard copy, Kindle, and audiobook. So anybody who's interested can can explore that. Um, and uh, I wish everybody the best of luck and just to just try to be patient and take it day by day. And soon your soon your your knowledge base will grow. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. I tell people that all the time, like the time is going to pass five years from now, you will be five years older. You could have That's learned right. in that time. You could have read uh, 10,000 pages of the world's best literature in that time, but the time is going to pass. What will you do with that? Well, well said. Hey, give us some, uh, give us some social media handles and then I'll let you go back to all of your litigious bullshit. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm a, uh, my, my, uh, my website again, uh, Q uh, uh, and there's links on there to my Twitter and Facebook uh, page. Uh, uh, on Twitter, at my handle is uh, Quintus Curtius, and uh, I look forward. To any anybody who has any questions can can email me from those places, and be happy to answer any any questions that come up. But stay positive, stay motivated, keep the morale up, and uh, stay in there for the long game. 
dang it, man, you've got a podcast too. Do I have to plug everything for you? Uh, well, I, I, I have that. I, I like to t- talk about things that have, are interest to me every now and then. And I consider it more of a, uh, I don't know, a, uh, monologue. Let's put it that way. Maybe just I, I, a little, uh, I listen to it. I think you, I think your, your podcast is a, um, it's like an audio journal that we can all eavesdrop on. You know, there's some travel stuff in there, personal impressions. You told about getting mugged in Brazil one time. You talk about the books you're reading. Um, it's interesting. You're an interesting guy. But that's Quintus Curtis. You can go check out his podcast as well. It's on iTunes and anywhere you find those things. It's called Fortress of the Mind. You can, uh, you can search for Quintus Curtius, Fortress of the Mind, and find that. And uh, listen to that. He's a big proponent of these great books. And, uh, and you know, he takes them very personally and has made them a part of his life. And that's what we're trying to do, too. So I, whether he knows it or not, he was an inspiration to me in uh, starting uh, OnlineGreatBooks.com and getting this work uh, underway for all the hundreds of people that are doing it with us. So thanks to, thanks to him for ins- inspiring me and showing me that it doesn't have to be in the halls of academia. It can be in your living room on a Thursday night. And, um, uh, he's adding to the, he's adding, to, he's leaving the wood pile taller than he found it. So I love, uh, Quintus Curtius, but go to our website. It's onlinegreatbooks.com and join us. You can uh, sign up for membership. If enrollment's open, when you're listening, it may not be open. If that's the case, you can join our waiting list and we'll send you all kinds of free goodies to make it worth your while. And then when we open enrollment, you can, uh, you'll be given a discount code that lets you join us for 15% off your, or 25% off your first three months. So go to onlinegreatbooks.com and sign up. Also, from time to time, we run $9 intro seminars to typically Plato's Mino. Uh, we've also done, we'll also uh, be doing some on some Aristotle as well. Uh, but you can get in there and see what the uh, seminar experience is like. We say that people uh, people come for the accountability. The books are cheap, right? You can get them at, at you know get them online for nothing. Often you can get them at used bookstores for a dollar a piece. The books are cheap. Uh, the reading lists are free, so people come for the accountability. But we know that they stay for the seminar experience. So we want you to uh, get a little taste of that because we know that you will love it and uh, find it very rewarding. So that's the Online Great Books podcast. Go check us out at onlinegreatbooks.com. You can follow us at Online Great Books on Instagram or Twitter. And uh, talk to you next time. <laughs>